that'll be the last scratch, I guess, for this for this session. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a conversation, um, and the basically this came about because we were both Emily and I were approached by Indicade to talk about narrative and interactive narrative, and both of us, I think I can speak for both of us, <laughs> feel that talks on this topic are often overly vague and generalized in a way that they aren't in other media. That like when we talk about story in games, we're just like, how do we make better story? And when you talk about story in, in fiction, you talk about something. Um, so we want to talk about something. And when we tried to think about what the something could be that would be really interesting to talk about in terms of why, why we feel like generally that games don't reach the level of storytelling depth that other media do and how they could approach it better, we came up with an idea of interiority. So this is a shot um, from Breaking Bad. I was going to show the video, but I didn't know how the light would be here, and obviously there'd be sound problems. Um, uh, and, and what I like about this scene, this is a scene from the third season where um, the, the wife of the main character in Breaking Bad, if you don't know the story, it's about a chemistry teacher who, when he gets cancer, uh, decides to sell meth to support his family. She has discovered something fairly terrible. And the scene is basically structured around her driving out to, to Four Corners. They live in Albuquerque. So she drives out to the Four Corners of the States, which is a little monument. And she stands at the center of it looking down, and she flips a coin. And the coin lands just off of the center. And she looks at it, and this is the shot of her looking at the coin. And then she walks away. There is no dialogue in this scene. It's never explained what the coin flip is, or why she flips the coin, or what the meaning of the coin flip is. But the scene is extremely powerful, because it manages to communicate something about her interior state without actually having to explain anything. Like, we know she's in a really tough place. She know, we know she's at a crossroads. We know that she's leaving things up to fate because she can't make up her own mind. We know she comes to a decision. We know she returns. And we know all of that because the, the vehicle of film is trying to communicate that to us. But it does it in a way that's not at all expository. Right? It does it through its aesthetic. And that, that move to interiority is something that we see in great works of fiction overall, in, in film, in theater, in novels. Um, in, in comics, like in, in all the other narrative forms that we have, we see that the move to exploring characters' inner states, like what, what motivates them? Why are they motivated? What are their ambivalences? What are their fundamentalisms? How do those things come in conflict? That that's very much at the heart of what makes these kind of stories interesting. And I would argue that a piece like Breaking Bad is really only interesting as a narrative, ultimately because of the fact that we imagine the characters' in, internal lives. So the question that Emily and I wanted to ask was, how do games try to represent that kind of interiority, or motive, as the title says? Like, how do games explore why characters do what they do? If we see that as a sort of a center for how narrative is interesting, and a center for what we look for from good narrative, how do games try to explore that topic? And what are the techniques that games have used up to this point, and to what levels of success? Um, and I think the one other thing that, that we want to say to introduce this topic is that when we talk about how games approach interiority, we mean this from a system level. Like, this is not about how a game's story might include interiority, or how games' characters might, you know, because obviously games have plots, so characters do things, right? And they're clearly motivated to do them. This is about the way that the play activity of the game actually has some relationship to that motivated, motivational structure. Like, how does the game actually recognize motivation? How does the game represent motivation through play? Is that something the player has control of or doesn't have control of? And if so, what kind of effect does that have on the outcomes of play? If you haven't realized, this is an intellectual and theoretical talk. <laughs> we have lots of examples. <laughs> yeah, but we have lots of examples. So. The first example we want to talk about is games that, that don't actually think very hard about interiority and don't actually present interiority to the player at all. They just give the player a vehicle to play, and they let the player effectively think whatever they want. So like, and it, so I think, I think the way to think about this is like games where the protagonist basically has no personality. Yes. Well, no, no personality sort of predefined. Necessarily. Yeah. 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 So, like, and like, I, I, like, I think the classic example of this is Half Life, right? So, so Gordon Freeman is a character, right? And he does stuff, and certainly people talk to him, right? <laughs> but like, he has, he doesn't ever talk back, and and there's never any indication that he has any motivation at all, other than just to keep moving forward. And the game doesn't ever try to make you feel like you're playing with his motivations in any way. You just kind of do what he does and think whatever you want. Yes. So, I mean, often sort of in a context where you have to, I mean, you're, you're sort of forced into situations where you have to defend yourself and do things, so you can sort of assume that he must be feeling some emotions of a sort of very basic fear and 
and a need to preserve himself. But beyond that, there's it's kind of up to the player to decide how he might feel about particular things or, or situations. Yeah, and I feel like 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 motivations like that, like survival, don't count. Right. Towards fiction, right? Because I don't think there's any interesting development that happens because you want to just like like there's no interesting story that's just like you have to survive. It's like <laughs> you have to survive, but your child is left behind, or you have to survive, but you're compromising your morals, or you have to survive, but there's some source of, of internal conflict at work, which is really the the point. And if if the entire point is like I have to do something or I'm going to die, there's probably not a lot of internal <laughs> conflict about whether you're going to do it or not, unless you've got some other value at work that's being challenged. But we don't really see that here. Yeah, and I think that I, I mean I think this is true of a lot of games that are deliberately trying to stay open in terms of yeah. who characters are. So like World of Warcraft, I think is another really good example of a game that just does not. You know, there's tons of plot in World of Warcraft. Like like there's tons of little quests and stuff, but none of them ever care about how you feel about them or really reflect any kind of any kind of internal process that that your character might feel. But I think it's an interesting point because as soon as you as soon as you start having a multiplayer game, then you have a context where the players can make up their own stories about why they're doing things and share them with the other players, even if the game itself doesn't care at all. So you can have an idea of like, why did I do this and why did I care about this that you're telling to other people, which is not, but it, at the level of sort of what is the game trying to elicit from you. Well, I mean, this gets into that frothing idea, right? You know, <laughs> that like the story is gonna just like, that the game could just be sort of like, like this inspiration pad that story could just spill out of, right? I mean, that's what I hear when I hear that. It's like, oh, yeah, I did a bunch of stuff in the game, and then I thought about it, and I was like, oh, I probably did it for this reason. I could tell an interesting story about that, and then I sat down and wrote that story. Right, but that, that does create, at some level, an experience for the player that does incorporate motivation. It's just entirely on them to come up with it and share it and decide how much they care about it. To what extent do you think the system is responsible for encouraging that stuff? Because I would say World of Warcraft doesn't encourage it at all. It just well, very little, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's entirely sort of a something that people put on as a superstructure. I mean, I get really weird about frothing because I feel like, like I, I mean, what I, I, I said this in some other talk that like, I could go out to a, like on a pub crawl with a bunch of my friends and that could become a really interesting story that I could tell, but that wasn't a system designed to tell stories. That was just me going having fun with my friends. No, but I mean, I think there are, you know, any, any system that's creating moments where you know, something ambiguous could happen, you, you know, you choose to save this person or save that person. Anytime you've got something like that, that, that does create a little bit more sort of for people to spin out a motivation about than like, and then I was thirsty so I had another beer. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's, you know, there, there is some idea of are there evocative ideas here? Are there points of tension here that then can be spun out into something to discuss? And just the fact of having a multiplayer environment makes it possible to do that, to, to have somebody, I mean, I think an important point here is you've got somebody to be an audience to your ideas about your character, which happens in multiplayer, and trying to reproduce that in a single player system is considerably more challenging. Well, can you, I mean, can you think of a multiplayer game that that does that not at the level of sort of a role-playing server that was specifically designed for that purpose? Because I feel like you could, you could go into World of Warcraft in the one where everyone speaks in fake medieval language and then like, just like perform that. Right. But can you, I mean, is there a game that you think deliberately creates those moments? Um. I mean, there are, there are a few games, I mean, this, this is skipping ahead a lot, but there are a few games that do kind of encourage you to pick out things from your experience that were important to you or interesting to you about what you played and share that information with other players. Um, and sometimes that's sort of in a viral context, but sometimes it's just part of play. And so um, one thing that comes to mind is Fall in London, which I think we've got a slide of yeah. way farther way, way on. Far down. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but... Um, there, there's there's a story in which you've got sort of lots of, it's a browser-based game that you play sort of over many days, you keep coming back to. It's got lots of little stories in it and lots of little things that can happen in different places. It's a big open world, but it does several things to kind of encourage you to decide like what out of this is important to you and what do you want to share with other people. So you have in your character profile, your sort of mantelpiece where you're allowed to indicate what objects or qualities or events from the game were really important to you and kind of put those into your profile almost as kind of like a, a journal of what's key to your character. And it's a fairly, you know, it's not a huge sort of feature of the game that's arresting your attention all the time, but it is kind of indicative. And sometimes if you go through and look at other people's Fall in London profiles, like you can see that they've put a particular animal or a particular weapon or something on their mantelpiece. And obviously that means like that is something about who they think their character is. 
um, being expressed that way. Oh, so, I mean, I, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, because I, I think a lot of games don't have any intentionality behind it. They're yeah. just trying to be universal. And it's interesting to think about a way that you could leave the net this open and still have it be meaningful somehow. Um, a second possibility is that, that the game, through the narrative, actually forces the player into a particular interiority. Um, and like the example that I like to think of for this is God of War, particularly the original God of War. Um, God of War is very much about Kratos and who Kratos is, which is a monster, like a cursed monster who destroyed his family. And so there are scenes in the game where you are like literally forced to do horrible things and to proceed you have to do horrible things. The one that comes to mind for me is the scene where there's a door that will only open if you sacrifice someone in front of it in a fire pit and you have to drag a person in a cage who's been left here for this purpose uh, across a long room and it takes like, 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 like two minutes to just drag this person all the way across into the pit and the person's screaming at you the whole time, please don't kill me, I have a family and all this stuff. But you can't proceed unless you do this. Like, there's just no way for the game to go forward. So you don't have a choice. You have to be a monster. Right. Well, I mean, this is what the Portal Companion Cube is riffing on, right? Like, here's a box. You have to destroy it. You're going to feel really... You know, and it's like the game is actually telling you to feel bad about destroying the <laughs> box. And it's, it's totally shoving the motivation onto you. And yet, somehow, for a lot of people, that actually is kind of effective. Like, I did feel kind of bad about destroying the box, even though I totally knew I was being played with. Yeah, I have so. a three-foot companion <laughs> cube in my office. Um, so, yes, <laughs> that was meaningful to me, too. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's, I, I, mean, I mean, how... I, it's interesting. Like, I actually really like God of War. I like it a lot, because I feel like it's, 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 it's horrible. Like, what you have to do is horrible. Um, but I'm not, I mean, this is a place where I think the intention becomes really meaningful and the meta structure that Portal uses by sort of dictating to you how Stockholm Syndrome works and like how you bond to objects. Right. And, like, <laughs> like just actually explaining the whole process to you and then doing it is like part of the trick to that, to, to that being successful. But I feel like this is the sphere that a lot of narrative games operate in. You know, you know I think all of the cinematic games, Last of Us, Uncharted, are all operating in that space. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting question of like the extent to which we feel that when we're told that we're playing this character and the character is someone very specific, like Nathan Drake or something like that, um, the, like how much we can actually attach to that interiority. Do we have a, because I think that's trying the most closely to resemble like film and novels and, and yeah. other fictional forms. So, well, I mean, you, you've got, if you've got a character that you really sort of deeply object to, that's going to be challenging, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's aesthetically unsuccessful. Um, so that, that sort of tension between here is a well-articulated, strongly motivated character who is doing all of this stuff that I personally think is horrible um, can still be a really powerful experience. And, and then the question becomes like, how long am I actually willing to play this game? Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it still can be... And, and one of the things that I, I mean, this is slightly a side point, but I, but I think there are some games manage to draw you into performing those really terrible things and sort of um, for a moment overlooking or accepting the, the motivation that's horrible by sort of misdirecting you from it a little bit. So they say like, okay, there's going to be this, this difficult game challenge, which is going to be, I'm going to make it really difficult for you to kill this character. Um, and so as a player, you become sort of motivated to attach to the challenge. Like, how am I going to solve this? And you get sucked into accomplishing the thing that the game as a game has given you to accomplish. And then, you know, once you've actually done it, you're like, did I actually, was that actually a good thing? Did I want to do that? And so in a, in a weird way, the, the sort of, the game aspect of it pulls you into performing something and accepting the motive that goes with it, even though if you were just being asked, like, is this something that you would want to do, you would say no. Right, I think, I think again, something that's in this later, but I think Shadow of the Colossus is like the exemplar of that, right? Like you're given this like really hard puzzle thing to do. It's very, very difficult to, to pull off. You are supposed to feel triumphant when you succeed, and what you basically <laughs> did was kill a whale. <laughs> so, so I feel like that's like, I mean, I, I think that, that, like, that that kind of juxtaposition is really interesting, where, you, where you know, if, you're, if you're paying attention to the death scenes in, in Shadow of the Colossus, you kind of have to ask yourself why you're going forward. Um, but more on that later. Um, and then I think, I think a third way to think about it is games that actually allow the player to choose a particular interiority. So it's not open. It's not like the, the avatar doesn't have potential. It's that the player gets to navigate what the system has allowed to be possible. And, you know, I think, I think like Bethesda's games, ooh, that's a blurry screenshot. I think, uh, like, I, I think, I think like the kind of, like, 
the, these open world games and the sort of Fallout uh, Elder Scrolls game, they do that by having you ally with different people and choose which sides you're supporting and stuff like that. You really get to define whether you're like good or evil in a fairly complicated way relative to the to the rel the, the social structures in the worlds that you inhabit. Right. So because I mean, but effectively, what you have at that point is your character's inferiority is about sort of alignment with particular external parts of the culture, and so that's kind of drawing out like, do you feel most comfortable with this group, most comfortable with that group, as a way of kind of reflecting what might be going on in your character's head and what their principles and values might be. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly feel that way when I play these games, that the decisions I'm making are because I'm playing a certain character. Yeah. Right, and I understand it that way. I mean, do, I, do you think that's true for most players, that that's what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't, I mean, you know, one, the, the one conclusion that I've come to the, the more I've done this is that people don't play games the same way. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what's true for most players, but I think, um, I think it is possible to kind of encourage that for people who are, who are interested in it, in sort of giving people more and more scope for effectively character improv and giving them um, opportunities, you know, whether that be through dialogue to, to speak different ways, to say that they care about different things, or, you know, sort of small gestural level things that can represent, you know, who they are. And I think even, um, even things like sort of character self-costuming and so on becomes very, you know, if, if somebody has a strong concept of who their character is, then they can get very invested in, like, I need to have all black armor because that's, when, <laughs> that's what my guy would wear, right? But, you know, that, so the system kind of allows you to, to get a little bit creative that way in order to reinforce your own notion of what's going on. Well, and I think it becomes really very much then about whether the system, um, whether the system maps to your intentions correctly. Right? I yes. think a lot about the ending of Silent Hill 2, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Right, But the endings are kind of weird because you could end up in bad endings because you just did adventure gamey things. The way, if you don't know how Silent Hill 2's interactive narrative works is that there's no choice points in, in Silent Hill 2. Instead, as you like, like just basically go through the game, it just tracks certain things. How much health you had, how many times you used health packs, whether you looked at a certain item a certain number of times. But it's also kind of an adventure action game. So, so you do adventure action-y things like try to use the knife everywhere because you, it's a knife and you got it. So it clearly <laughs> has some purpose. And, but the game gives you an ending based on what you did. And I think that's a really interesting technique, but I think it kind of fails because when I'm looking at the knife, I'm not necessarily thinking about suicide. I may just be trying to figure out what this tool is for. Right. And the game can, can miss like if the, if the system isn't aligned properly with what I'm expecting. Right. Well, that was, I mean, that was a consistent issue that I had with Fable, was that it was, I constantly, I would do something that, that had no special meaning to me, like wander into some guy's house, and Fable would decide, oh, you just broke into this guy's house, and that means that you have end points more of evil, and I'm going to, like, work on putting little horns on your head. And I'm like, I was lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean that, and, and just you know, the, all of these moments where there's the, there was a clearly a designed narrative that had things that I w were supposed to be the things that I as the player cared the most about, but then there were other things that had emerged from the simulational experience that were what I actually cared about, and they sort of you know diverged in this weird way, so that like it, it felt like we sort of were it was like riding a bike that was slightly misaligned or something. Was, yeah, yeah, I think that's actually like this really dramatic change that happened between Mass Effect One and Mass Effect Two. Where in Mass Effect 1, I would often make dialogue choices where I felt like Shepard was saying something that I had no intention to do. And then in Mass Effect 2, and I'm not sure how this happened, suddenly I felt like, oh, every time Shepard's saying something, it's basically what I expect him to say. And I'm not sure, I, I, I mean, I think that's writing, honestly. I mean, it's a weird kind of writing, but it's a writing <laughs> of interface to intention that's yeah. a more intelligent way to work. But I think that's, I mean, if I were gonna really, really study this, like, like for, for an academic purpose or for my own design purposes, I would really look at that transition and try to figure out, like, what did they do in the second game that made that so much more powerful? Well, I think one thing that can make it easier to do is if you have a character who is at least partly defined, and then you can sort of imagine, like, the, you and the player can have an understanding between you of, you know, there's, there's a certain scope of things that are possible outcomes for this character, and they, these are the sorts of things that could be their motives. And there's a whole range of other motivations and personalities that are we're just not going to try to model at all because that's not who this character is and so then you know once you've narrowed the range that way it's a lot easier to then sort of be responsive to what the player is doing within that well-defined you know oh yeah i mean context. i think in like certainly in like things like live action design i use that all the time like this is a shakespearean comedy and right, right everybody kind of knows like this these are the tropes yeah. 
Yeah, well, genre is a huge help with this. Oh, yeah, and then it's Versus, too, right? right? Yeah. I mean, that's, like, that's yeah. all over that. It's like, you're okay, this is like a little this is a little dinner party in like a 19th right. century novel. Right, and so, I mean, that allows us to say, okay, your character is, there are certain things that your character is just never going to do. You're not going to leap up and tear off all your clothes because it's <laughs> like, it's Austin-esque, so no, <laughs> yeah. it's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that this can also be done in a much more open-ended way. Which I, which I think is more interesting, where like you can actually bring user-generated content to it in a much stronger way. So right. like something like Penny for, you, for My Thoughts. Yeah, no, Penny for My Thoughts, um, I don't know how many people have, have run into this, but it's, um, it's an indie tabletop role-playing game about um, sort of story creation. But the premise of it is that you and all of the other people at the table, and usually it's sort of a three or four player game, um, you are all people who have had something traumatic happen to you in your past and you're now suffering from amnesia and you're undergoing some sort of drug process is going to bring back your memories. Um, but what's interesting about it from, from our point of view is that it, it starts with the character's interior experience and works out to the level of plot. So each move begins with, you've got this little stack of um, pieces of paper with things written down on them that are sort of evocative. So like the smell of pine trees or the sound of a gong or something like this. Um, and you're, so as, to, to start your move, you pick up one of these pieces of paper and you say something like, um, I'm remembering a happy experience that I had um, and um, I associate this with the sound of a gong. And then one of the other players will say, oh, well, you know, was it a dinner gong or you know, something like this? And, the, and it, it, you improvise in this sort of yes and way, building up an actual narrative, but starting out from what was the feeling that was at the center of this moment and then kind of building the story out around it. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but if you're, if you're interested in narrative and you're not familiar with the indie RPG scene, it's, it's really important that you take a look at it because there's all these crazy innovations going yes. on in that space. Yes, and there are a number of really cool meetups. Um, Seattle has an awesome story gaming meetup group, um, and other places do too. So. Yeah, New York does too. Yeah. Uh, we got Burning Wheel in New York, so <laughs> Luke does a lot. Um, so... I think the second half of this is talking about like where inter interiority sits at the mechanical level. Like, like what is the system actually? So aside from how does the game express interiority, how does it ask the player to express interiority? How does the system refer to that interiority once it's in the system? Like, does the system actually care that you're you have a view of your character, or does the system care what you're thinking? Or if it does care, how does it express that? And is that a part of the play experience? And so I think. To start, it's interesting to think about games where there's forced interiority, and like, does the mechanic reflect that? Like, is this something that the mechanic reflects? And so, um, I think that Red Dead Redemption is an interesting case of both success and failure, right? I think that the end of Red Dead Redemption is brilliant, in the sense that it, it puts you in this moment that is such a such a, a profound gunslinger moment, that it asks you to sort of play through that moment. We're far enough away; I can spoil this, right? Okay, yeah. so you're, you're basically <laughs> killed as your family rides away by being betrayed by the lawman you've been helping the whole time. And, it, and it's a scene where like, you're surrounded by gunmen and you're given the opportunity to shoot at them, but there's like 12 of them and you're going to die. And it, it, there's just no way you can shoot fast enough to kill all of them. So, so the mechanic actually pushes you into the mindset that you have and trying to make you feel that desperation. But the flip side is um, Mexico. And, and you know Mexico is horrible. Um, but it's, it's, I think the really annoyed me about Mexico was the fact that like, I was suddenly asked in the plots in Mexico to take part in a revolution on the part of an evil governor, effectively. And I wanted to fight with the revolution. Like I hated the guy, I just wanted to shoot him every time I saw him, but the game would never let me do that. I had to go like do these things against the rebels and the game never really acknowledged that I didn't want to do it or gave me any vehicle to not do it. And I would argue that that the airport scene in, in Call of Duty, like the famous like kill people in the airport scene, even that gave me more freedom because you don't have to shoot in that scene if you don't want to. You can just walk through it and shoot in the air and the whole scene just moves. So I don't actually have to kill anybody in that scene if I don't want to. <laughs> but in Red Dead, I have to like burn a village full of rebels and I have to watch them burn, um, even though my character would just like kill the whole palace when I had the first chance. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think this is like the danger in like putting interiority on people is that like if, if they start, if you give them any freedom to establish who their character is, and then you skew from their expectation of the right. character, then they no, just once feel like Once you've promised the player some agency over that, you really have to keep that promise, because otherwise you just, you know, it's, if, if you're going to stick them in a box, then they have to stay in the box all game long. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, my, my favorite moment in Red Dead was, uh, w there's a quest that starts with a poker game, 
And and you and you know you know like Marsters walks past the poker game. And they're like, hey, you never are playing poker. You should come and sit down with us. And he's like, well, I don't know. I don't play much. And I had literally played more poker in that game than done anything else. <laughs> and, I, and I was just like, what, what? Are you paying any attention to how I play? Like, like half my game is poker. Um, so I, I think that I think that's like 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 it's exactly what you said. Like if you're going to enforce the interiority, then you then don't give people any freedom. And if you give them freedom, make sure you're tracking that freedom because the second they feel that disconnect, then they're just not attached to the character anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Arkham Asylum is a game that does this well. Like, you play Batman and you do Batman-y things most of the time. And every time you do a Batman-y thing, you feel more like Batman. I, I, I like it for that. I think, it's, I think it's a really good expression, you know, especially like these sort of like little cut scenes like where you take out Zaz with the, with the batarang from around the corner. You just yeah, feel yeah. so like badass ninja. Like, it's, it's just like you get the, the Batman taste is in your mouth. I was all about the ledge takedowns myself. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it was the, the amount of skulking and sneaking and so on that you're allowed to do is, is very gratifyingly Batman-y. And I think a lot of that is because guns are so scary in that game. Yes. You know, like, you really feel like you're going to die if you get <laughs> shot. Um, and then we mentioned Saddle of the Colossus, yep. right? which I think is, um, to me, is an exemplar of, like, embodying mechanic in, um, in narrative in mechanic by making Wander so determined at every cost, so willing to sacrifice everything, so constantly exhausted and struggling by making him, like, do horrible things in the service of something that he should never be doing in the first place, that literally your, attri your only attribute is stamina. Like, yeah. I just think so much of that game is just sort of revolving around that interiority, and I think it's a really good study. I mean, this is a big game. There are, I think, smaller games, which we're gonna look at in a second, which do this, I think, just as effectively. But I think this is a really good example of how a mechanic can be just completely infused with narrative. Yeah, though, I mean, there are other, you can also do this at the level not of what's actually going on in the game, but at the level of the UI, too. I mean, when you see in Heavy Rain those moments where all of the controls start wildly shaking because it represents that your character is supposed to be really upset, which then is ma going to make you more likely to make some sort of mistake and, and do something that you didn't maybe really want to do, which I found really annoying, and, and it was a really irritating aspect of the gameplay for me, but I had to admit that I could understand why they were doing that and what they were going for, is like produce this anxiety in the player that replicates the anxiety of the character and create the likelihood of a fatal mistake that you can't take back, which, you know, which I repeatedly did, like I shot people I didn't want to shoot and like kill, you know, so. But I think the third origami challenge where you cut off your own finger, that's like, that's the high watermark <laughs> of that thing. Because like when I had that scene, I was like, I walked in and I'm like, oh, this is Saw. This is torture porn. I don't want to play torture porn. Screw this. Where's the knife? I just grabbed the first thing I saw. I didn't look around the room. And I went to cut my finger off. Because I was like, great, that's what you want me to do? Awesome. Let's go for it. Uh, <laughs> but the controls were so twitchy and weird that I missed the first time. I just failed. And then I watched a character freak out. And the, res the feedback was so good of the character freaking out <laughs> that it actually freaked me out a little bit. And then I had to do it again, and I had to really concentrate, and it was horrible. And I was like, wow, this actually is like torture. This is kind of amazing. <laughs> if only I could walk in this game. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. I, and the mystery story made any sense. I don't know. Um, but smaller games that do this, like Polaris. Yeah, no, Polaris is another um, indie RPG, and in this case, one in which the, the sort of structure is about you and um, all of the other characters are uh, sort of noble knights living in this doomed society at the North Pole, which is why you get the, the name Polaris. Um, and the deal is that every time, you, have a, you start off with a certain number of points that sort of represent your, your virtue and courage, and every time that you do something that contravenes your, your own ethics and values or what it means to be a Knight of Polaris, you lose one of those points. And so you, you also have another, another player in the game who is your antagonist, and the, the job of that player is to try and set up situations where you're going to have two of your values be in conflict or some situation where you're going to be pushed to a point where you have to do something that goes against one of your core values and desires. And so the, the structure of the game is that you are going to keep losing these points. And when you get down to a certain level, then um, new narrative events happen. And then finally, you get down to enough that you're, you're sort of understood to be corrupt. So it's a mechanic that enforces you know, this game, like, it's, a, it's a, in some ways a very free-form game in that you can tell a Polaris story with all sorts of contents in them and many different things can happen. 
um, and you can tweak the setting of a little bit. But no matter what you do, it's going to be a tragedy because that's what the mechanics are. Um, and it's going to be a tragedy about people of high ideals and, and great courage being destroyed by reality and becoming corrupted and losing their faith. And that's the story it's going to be. And I think that you know there are other games that do this quite well, and I think we should accelerate a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Towards the end. Um, but like Rendition, which is an IF about torturing somebody, like I think this, this, is, this is what you do in the game, um, which I think, I, which you pointed out, is like a game that you basically, you play for three moves and then you quit. Right, but like I feel like the, that's a valid playing of it. <laughs> like it's, it's like I had the experience of thinking about this, and then I was like, I hate this. I'm not going to play a game about this. I'm quitting. But it also it sort of left you with this this after. I mean, this this came out sort of during the height of of the Bush torture news situation. And so you know, even after you quit the game, you're sort of left thinking about like, to what degree am I complicit in this kind of thing? Like, ah. Um, well, I think it points to an, an, another way you can do this forced interiority, which is you don't tell the player what to do. You just design the system to force them to do it. And then you force them to face the consequences of what they've done. Um, you know, and Necrotic Drift is another game that you talked about losing that spirit. Right, yeah. No, so Necrotic Drift is an IF game in which um, your protagonist is this guy who's like one accomplishment in life is uh, several years back winning this big D&D challenge. So you've been sort of like living on your, your winnings from this D&D championship. Um, and you've got this girlfriend who's kind of sick of your obsession with monsters and, and role-playing games, um, except then you know you, the, your local mall gets attacked by monsters and all of your D&D know-how becomes the way that you save your friends, and, and that's great. And so you play the whole game like killing these monsters. Um, and then there's this, at the end of the game, you have this conversation with your girlfriend, which I still think is one of the most like gut-wrenching things that I've run into in an IF game where she tells you that um, you know, it, it, the, the reason that she's kind of been on your case is that she actually was pregnant, but she decided that you were not up to being a father, and so she had an abortion without asking you. And, and the sort of conversation is about, like, you're not able to concentrate on anything other than your obsession. And the thing is that as a player, you just have spent the entire game like obsessively running around killing monsters and thinking about only that and sort of blowing off conversational opportunities, because that's what you had to do to win the game. Um, so it, it, it shunted you as a player into enacting this particular behavior, and then says, OK, well, so here's the outcome of that. So in a way, the game has set you up, but I still found it really effective. And then, you know, I'm going to skip ahead, because sure, we're going to yeah. get, get through the end of this. And then I think the other thing is, and we talked about this a bit, is like the way that, that if you're allowed to choose motives, how the system re reinforces them. We talked a bit about Fable and the ways that that can miss, like yeah. where, the way the intention can miss, and then you can just feel like you're in the wrong place. We also talked about things like Fallout, where that's read into a, kind of a fairly simplistic social structure um, as, a, as a shorthand for this. Um, I think um, a game like Alabaster, where you sort of express your interiority, the game kind of forces you to talk about what you're thinking yeah. by asking questions is another example of a way you can sort of, the system can elicit that and then Alabaster's paths change based on what you ask and how you express it, which, yeah. is, which is not an uncommon IF technique. I'm no, sure. no, it's not. I mean, dialogue, one of the reasons that I find dialogue so interesting is that it, it becomes a way of getting at character interiority because, you know, you can have these conversations about what are you doing and why are you doing it. Um, and obviously then there's another layer of like, am I willing to tell you about why I'm doing this or am I going to lie to you? But um, but that kind of allows a little bit of delving into that territory. And then I think a really fascinating example of this that's worth talking about is Walking Dead, the Telltale Walking Dead game, because um, Walking Dead does ask you in moments to express your interiority, and, and, and in a way that's almost pure, I, I haven't seen a game like this, it has literally no effect on the system. It's literally just, are you going to lie? This is the scene where, where, where Lee is talking to Clementine about what he did. Because she's sort of discovered he did something bad, and he's, he has to explain to her. And the choices you have in the scene are pretty broad. It's like, you could lie, you could tell the truth, you could be vague. But the game doesn't really change dramatically as a result of that. The sto Clementine's story is always the same. This is really just about what kind of character are you playing. And down to the final moments of, Walking Dead, uh, of, of the Walking Dead game, you get these moments with Lee where you're allowed to express his interiority. What I think is fascinating about Walking Dead is that it's never entirely clear how guilty you are of yeah. the crime you're accused of committing because the only person who ever actually expresses the truth about what you did is you. Yeah, no, I've talked to a number of different people about what happened in the game and they have radically different ideas about like, oh, G Lee was guilty, Lee was not guilty, Lee, you know, well, it was, it, it, 
just, you know, it was sort of a moment of panic or, you know, sort of, they all have their own notion of what the backstory really is, which I think is quite cool. And I think it's neat that we can look at interactive narrative from just, uh, this is a good note to end on, actually. We can look at the interactive narrative just from the perspective of defining the interiority, having no effect on the plot of the game at all. Um, it's just like, like, I mean, what Walking Dead as an interactive narrative is really about is Lee is going to have this story, which is always the same. Who is the Lee who went on that story? Yes. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's, that's still, I mean, th that gets back to one of the things that we were talking about earlier, though, which is that you're giving the player a pretty limited set of possibilities. Like, there are, there are a certain number of interesting questions about Lee, right? Um, and they're defined by the events that happen in the story and then his own backstory. And you can have all sorts of opinions about those, and you can play them different ways, and you can create different relationships with the other characters and be more or less trusting, and all of those are sort of express possibilities. But they're still within a pretty well-defined channel. And there are lots of other characterizations that you can't perform for Lee that are just not available. And so, I mean, that, that, that kind of leads to the, to, to the like, this, this is what we're talking about. I mean, our intent here was never to sort of tell you how to do this, because we don't think this is an answerable question. But really to look at, like, the way games have approached these issues and to think about what the kind of the system effects and the system relationship is to those things. So we hope this has been um, at least an interesting conversation that sort of circulates some of the ideas that we've talked about and sort of explored at least one topic of interactive narrative in a slightly deeper way. That's what we got. Do we want to